just like to begin by saying a word about what a privilege and uh, honor it is to be able to participate in the uh, celebration of the remarkable success of democracy now for these many years, and uh, in particular, the quite astonishing achievements of Amy Goodman, uh, Juan Gonzalez, their colleagues, in uh, showing us how we might aspire to achieve democracy now. It'll be a long struggle, and again, it's uh, an enormous pleasure to be able to share this occasion with people like Harry Belafonte, who has been such an inspiration in being in the forefront of this endless struggle for many hard years. And for the young people among you, uh, uh, special word, uh, you'll be facing problems that have never arisen in the 200,000 years of human history, a hard, demanding problems. It's a burden that you can't ignore, and uh, uh, we'll all, you in particular, and all the rest of us will have to be in there struggling hard to save the human species from a pretty grim fate. Well, my wife and I happened to be in Europe uh, on November 8th, that fateful day. Uh, in fact, uh, in Barcelona, uh, where we watched the results come in. Now, that had special personal resonance for me. Uh, the first article I wrote, or at least that I can remember, was in uh, February 1939 uh, at the it was about the fall of Barcelona to Franco's fascist forces. And it was the article, which I'm sure was not very memorable, was about the apparently inexorable spread of fascism over Europe and uh, maybe the whole world. Um, old enough to have been able to listen to Hitler's speeches, the Nuremberg rallies, not understanding the words, but the tone and the reaction of the crowd was enough to leave uh, indelible memories. And watching those results come in did arouse some pretty unpleasant memories, along with what is happening in Europe now, which in many ways is pretty frightening as well. Well, the reaction to November 8th, uh, 8th in Europe was uh, disbelief, uh, shock, uh, uh, horror. It was captured uh, pretty eloquently in the, uh, on the front cover of the major German weekly, Der Spiegel. Uh, it depicted a, a caricature of Donald Trump uh, presented as a meteor uh, hurtling towards Earth, uh, mouth open, ready to swallow it up. And the top headline read, uh, uh, thus ended their Welt, the end of the world, small letters below as we have known it. Uh, there might be some truth to that concern, even if not exactly in the uh, manner in which the, uh, uh, the, the uh, uh, artists, uh, the authors, uh, the others who uh, echoed that uh, conception had in mind. It had to do with other events that were taking place right at the same time, uh, November 8th, events that I think were a lot more important than the ones that have captured the uh, attention of the world in such an astonishing fashion. Events that were taking place in Morocco, Marrakesh, Morocco. Uh, there was a c conference there of 200 countries, uh, uh, the uh, so-called COP22. Their goal at this conference was to uh, implement the rather vague promises and commitments of the preceding uh, international conference on global warming, COP21 in Paris in December uh, 2015, which had in fact been left vague. 
uh, for reasons not unrelated to what happened on November 8th here. Uh, the Paris conference had the goal of establishing verifiable commitments to do something about the worst problem that humans have ever faced, the likely destruction of the possibility for organized human life. They couldn't do that. They could only reach a, 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 a non-verifiable commitment, promises, but not, 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 uh, uh, not fixed by treaty uh, and a, a real commitment. And the reason was that the Republican Congress in the United States would not accept binding commitments. So they were left with something much weaker and looser. The Morocco conference intended to carry this forward by putting teeth in that loose, vague agreement. The conference opened on November 7th, normal way. Uh, November 8th, the World Meteorological Organization presented an assessment of the current state of what's called the Anthropocene, the new geological epoch that is uh, marked by radical human uh, uh, modification, uh, destruction of the environment that sustains life. November, November 9th, the conference basically ceased. Uh, the question that was left was whether it, it would be possible to carry forward this global effort to deal with the highly critical uh, problem of environmental catastrophe if the leader of the free world, uh, the richest and most powerful country in history, would pull out completely, as appeared to be the case. That's the stated goal of the president-elect, whose uh, regards climate change as a hoax and whose uh, policy, if he pursues it, is to maximize the use of fossil fuels, uh, end environmental regulations, dismantle the Environmental Protection Agency established by Richard Nixon, which is a measure of where politics has shifted to the right in the past generation, uh, and in other ways uh, accelerate the race to destruction. Well, that was essentially the end of the Marrakesh Conference. It terminated without any issue. Uh, so that might signal the end of the world, even if not quite in the intended sense. And in fact, what happened in Mar Marrakesh was a quite astounding spectacle. Uh, the hope of the world for saving us from this impending disaster was China, authoritarian, harsh China. That's where hopes were placed. At the same time, the, the leader of the free world, the richest, most powerful country in history, was acting in such a way as to doom the hopes to total disaster. It's an astonishing spectacle, and it's no less astounding that it received almost no comment. Uh, you can, something to think about. Well, the effects are quite real. Uh, COP21, the Paris negotiations, could not reach a verifiable treaty because of the refusal of the Republican Congress to accept binding commitments. The follow-up conference, COP22, uh, ended without any issue. Uh, we will soon see in the not very distant future even more dangerous, uh, horrifying consequences of this failure right here to come to term to, to address in a serious way this impending crisis. Uh, so say take uh, the country of Bangladesh. Uh, within a few years, uh, tens of millions of people will be fleeing from the low-lying coastal plains uh, simply because of the rise of sea level with the melting of the huge uh, Antarctic uh, glaciers much more quickly than was anticipated and the severe weather uh, associated with global warming. Uh, that's a refugee crisis of a kind that puts today's 
crisis, which is more a moral crisis of the West than an actual refugee crisis. It will put this current crisis into, uh, uh, it'll seem like a footnote to uh, a tragedy. And it's uh, uh, the leading uh, climate scientist in Bangladesh has reacted by saying that these migrants should have the right to move to the countries from which all these greenhouse gases are coming. Millions should be able to go to the United States. And, uh, the United States and indeed the other rich countries that have grown wealthy, as we all have, while bringing this new geological epoch uh, bringing about this new geological epoch, epoch which uh, may well be the final one for the species. And the catastrophic consequences can only increase. Uh, just keeping to South Asia, uh, temperatures which are already intolerable for the poor uh, are going to continue to rise as the Himalayan glaciers melt also destroying the water supply for South Asia. Uh, in India already, uh, 300 million people are reported to lack of water to drink, uh, uh, and it will continue both for India and Pakistan. And at this point, the two major threats to survival begin to converge. Uh, one is environmental catastrophe, the other is nuclear war, another threat that is increasing right before our eyes. Uh, India and Pakistan are nuclear states, nuclear weapons, states with nuclear weapons. They're all already almost at war. Uh, any kind of real war would immediately turn into a nuclear war uh, that might happen very easily over water short, over struggles over diminishing water supplies. A nuclear war would not only devastate the region, but might actually be terminal for the species if indeed it leads to nuclear winter and global famine, as many scientists predict. Uh, so the threats of survival to survival converge right there, and we're going to see much more like it. Meanwhile, the United States is leading the way to disaster, while the world looks to China for leadership. It's an incredible, astounding picture, and indeed only one piece of a much larger picture. Uh, the U.S. isolation at Marrakesh is uh, symptomatic of broader developments that we should think about pretty carefully. They're of considerable significance. Uh, U.S. isolation in the world is increasing in remarkable ways. Uh, maybe the most striking is right in this hemisphere, uh, what used to be called our little region over here, Henry Stimson, Secretary of War under Roosevelt, our little region over here where nobody bothers us. If anybody gets out of line, we punish them harshly. Otherwise, they do what we say. That's very far from true. Uh, during the, this century, Latin America, for the first time in 500 years, has freed itself from uh, Western imperialism. Last century, that's the United States. Uh, the International Monetary Fund, which is basically an agency of the U.S. Treasury, has been kicked out of, the, uh, of South America entirely. There are no U.S. military bases left. Uh, the international organizations, the, uh, the uh, hemispheric organizations are beginning to exclude the United States and Canada. Uh, in 2015, there was a summit coming up, and the United States might have been excluded completely from the hemisphere over the issue of Cuba. That was the crucial issue that the hemisphere, uh, on which the hemisphere opposed U.S. policy, as does the world. Uh, that's surely the reason why Obama made the gestures towards normalization uh, that were at least some step forward and could be reversed under Trump, we don't know. Uh, on a much more far-reaching scale, something similar is happening in Asia. 
the, uh, as you know, uh, one of Obama's major policies was the so-called pivot to age, Asia, which was actually a measure to confront China uh, transparently. Uh, one component of the uh, pivot to Asia was the TPP, the Trans-Pacific Partnership, which excluded China, tried to bring in other Asia-Pacific countries. Well, that seems to be on its way to collapse uh, for pretty good reasons, I think. But, uh, uh, at, the, at the same time, there's another international trade agreement that is expanding and growing, namely China's region, what they call their Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, which is now drawing in U.S. allies uh, from Peru to Australia to Japan. Uh, the U.S. will probably choose to stay out of it, uh, just as the United States virtually alone has stayed away from China's Asian Infrastructure Development Bank, a kind of counterpart to the World Bank that the U.S. has opposed for many years, but has now been joined by practically all U.S. allies, uh, Britain and others. Uh, that's uh, at the same time, China is expanding uh, to the West uh, with the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, the China-based Silk Roads, the, the uh, whole system is an integrated system of uh, energy resource uh, sharing and so on. Uh, it includes Siberia with its rich resources, it includes India and Pakistan, uh, Iran uh, it will soon join, it, it appears, and probably Turkey. This will extend all the way from China to Europe. Uh, the United States has asked for observer status, and it's been rejected, not permitted. Uh, one of the major commitments of the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, the whole of the Central Asian states, is that there can be no U.S. military bases in this entire region. Uh, another st step towards isolation may t soon take place if uh, the president-elect carries through his uh, promise to terminate the nuclear weapons, the nuclear deal with Iran. Uh, other countries who are parties to the deal might well continue. Uh, they might even ignore Europe mainly. That means ignoring U.S. sanctions. That will extend U.S. isolation even from Europe. And in fact, Europe might move under these circumstances uh, towards backing off from the confrontation with Russia. Actually, Brexit may assist with this because Britain was the voice of the United States in NATO, the harshest voice, now it's out, gives Europe some opportunities. Uh, there were choices in 1990-91, time of the collapse of the Soviet Union. Uh, Mikhail Gorbachev uh, had a, what he called a vision of a common European home, a, an integrated uh, a uh, cooperative system of security, uh, commerce, interchange, no military alliances from the Atlantic to the Pacific. Uh, the U.S. insisted on a different vision, namely Soviet Union collapses, and NATO remains and indeed expands uh, right up to the borders of Russia now, where very serious threats uh, are, uh, are, are evident uh, daily. Well, all of this, these are significant developments. They're related to the widely discussed uh, matter of decline of American power. Uh, uh, there are some conventional measures, uh, which, however, are misleading in quite interesting ways. I'll just say a word about it, because there's no time, but it's something to seriously think about. Uh, by conventional measures in 1945, uh, the United States had reached the peak of global dominance, uh, nothing like it in history. It had perhaps 50% uh, of total world's wealth. Uh, other industrial countries were devastated. Uh, 
or destroyed by the war, severely damaged. Uh, the U.S. economy had gained enormously from the war and, was in, and the U.S. in general had a position of dominance with no historical parallel. Well, that, of course, couldn't last. Other industrial countries reconstructed. Uh, by around 17, uh, 1970, uh, the world was described as tripolar, three major economic centers, uh, German-based Europe, uh, U.S.-based North America, and the Northeast Asian area at that time, Japan-based. Now China has moved in as a partner, conflict and partner. Uh, by now, by that time, U.S. share in global uh, wealth was about 25 percent, and today it's not far below that. Well, all of this is highly misleading because it fails to take into account a crucial factor which is almost never discussed. Though there's some interesting work on it. That's the question of ownership of the world economy. If you take a look at the corporate, the multinational corporations around the world, what do they own? Well, that turns out to be a pretty interesting matter. In virtually every, uh, this increasingly during the period of neoliberal globalization of the last uh, generation, uh, well, corporate wealth is becoming a more realistic measure of global power than national wealth. Uh, corporate wealth, of course, is nationally based, supported by taxpayers like us, but it, the ownership has nothing to do with us. Uh, corporate ownership, uh, if you look at that, it turns out that in virtually every economic sector, the manufacturing, finance, services, retail, and others, U.S. corporations are well in the lead in ownership of the global economy. And overall, uh, their ownership is close to 50 percent of the total. That's roughly the proportion of U.S. national wealth in 1945 tells you something about the nature of the world in which we live. Of course, that's not for the benefit of American citizens, but of those who own and manage these uh, private, uh, publicly supported, uh, private uh, quasi-totalitarian systems. If you look at the military dimension, of course, the U.S. is supreme. Nobody's even close. No point talking about it. But it is possible that Europe might take a more independent role. It might move towards something like Gorbachev's vision uh, that might lead to a relax relaxation of the rising and very dangerous tensions at the Russian border, uh, which would be a very welcome development. Well, there's a lot more to say about uh, the fears and hopes and prospects the threats and dangers are very real. There are plenty of opportunities. And as we face them, again, particularly the younger people among you, uh, we should never overlook the fact that the threats uh, that we now, are, uh, we now face are the most severe that have ever arisen in human history. They are literal threats to survival nuclear war, environmental catastrophe. These are very urgent concerns. They cannot be delayed. They became more urgent on November 8th for the reasons you know and that I mentioned. Uh, they have to be faced directly and soon if the human experiment is not to prove to be a, a disastrous failure. going to, Juan and I are just going to have a brief conversation. 
were these two lions. I think of them like outside the New York Public Library. <laughs> the lions that protect our knowledge. Now, <clears throat> I just want to start off by saying, you have just witnessed an historic moment. Is this the first time Harry and Noam that you have met? It's not the first time we've met, but it's the first time we've shared a platform together. Ah. And, uh, <laughs> it's a bit overwhelming. <laughs> a little intimidating. <laughs> to sit with so much knowledge and sensitivity. Anyway, it's nice to be with all of you. So we have this opportunity to talk with the two of you um, at this critical juncture in U.S. history and the world. Harry, back in 40, before you went off to war, you were banned from the Copacabana as an African-American. You come back and you're headlining there as one of the world's great entertainers and musicians. You marched in Selma with Dr. King and one of, were one of his closest confidants. Noam, you marched against the Vietnam War. You thought you'd be spending years, maybe decades in jail, even as you were rising in your academic career at MIT, willing to give up everything. You two giants of many movements, your thoughts today in the age no matter how extreme things might be in America, that uh, eventually our citizens would rise up and uh, righteously uh, stop the enemy at the gate, if not, in fact, uh, put them in retreat. And each time uh, certain events took place, uh, we met the horror and the terror of not only I referenced before to some, I noticed when I mentioned the Fourth Reich, wasn't quite sure what I was talking about. For just for clarity, uh, as you know, the, uh, the last great global torment was the Nazi era. It was called the Third Reich. And I thought that we had thoroughly cleansed ourselves of that encounter and that we would be much more resilient. But I think to a degree we do reveal some resilience, but the real test has not yet come until the inaugural transference has taken place. And what concerns me is that uh, beyond the mischief of Trump, and all those in his cabinet and the people that he's appointed into roles of leadership. I had never quite understood that we had another severe unattended enemy in our midst. And that was our species commitment or weakness in the face of absolute greed. I think we have failed to come to certain solid conclusions because we have been so contaminated with possessions and power uh, that we have forgotten that uh, we have destroyed our children or set the, the tone for that. 
I would welcome Professor Chomsky's point of view, and I hope he says something that will make me dance out of here. <laughs> well, I should say that uh, I was somewhat uh, immunized to the uh, Trump uh, Electoral College victory, of course, not popular victory, as you know, by the fact that uh, my wife was the only person I knew who, even before the Republican primaries, uh, predicted that Trump was going to win. Uh, she's looking at the country somewhat from the outside. She's from Brazil and felt that somehow she had her finger on the pulse of a large part of the country and was confident that this was going to happen. So I wasn't all that surprised. Uh, or uh, I think it's extremely dangerous in many ways, like the ones I mentioned and others that you're quite familiar with. Uh, on the other hand, there's plenty of opportunities. Uh, we should bear in mind that the country has become much more civilized in the past 50 or 60 years. Uh, a meeting like this could not have been conceivable in 1960, 1970. Uh, the kinds of commitment and engagement that you and many others like you are, uh, com are committed to is something quite new. And there have been many advances and achievements, uh, women's rights, uh, civil rights generally, um, rights of gays, uh, opposition to aggression, way uh, environmental concerns didn't even exist at that time. Uh, there's been tremendous progress. That means uh, that struggles today start from a much higher plane than they did not many years ago at the time when Harry was marching in Selma. It was a much harsher world than it is today. The reason is that plenty of people did commit themselves to constant dedicated struggle and there were plenty of achievements. And that goes back in American history. Uh, no need to review it, but the earlier period is one of total horror. I mean, after all, the country was founded on two incredible crimes, unbelievable crimes. Uh, one, ex ex virtual extermination of the indigenous population. It's kind of a migrant crisis of the kind we don't think about today. And a form of slavery, which was the most vicious in history and is in fact the basis for a large part of the wealth and uh, uh, economic development of the United States, England, France, and others. That's history. Uh, when Donald Trump talks about making the country great again, uh, for many people, it wasn't that great. Uh, quite the opposite. It was, uh, and, uh, uh, but the point is, there has been plenty of progress because people, people facing much harsher conditions than we do didn't give up. That's an important lesson. Uh, furthermore, even the election itself uh, suggests major opportunities. Uh, for one thing, as you know, uh, uh, the, uh, the Democrats actually had a considerable majority of the vote. Uh, and if you look at the younger voters, the people who will shape the future, uh, they were overwhelmingly anti-Trump and even more overwhelmingly uh, pro-Sanders. That's an and, uh, we should also bear in mind what a remarkable phenomenon the Sanders campaign was. I mean, there's, uh, Here's somebody uh, you know, unknown, came from nowhere, practically no one in the country knew who he was. He was using words like socialism, which used to be a real curse word. Uh, no, no corporate support, no media support, no support from the wealthy. Uh, everything that has always been crucial to winning elections 
mostly we have bought elections, had none of it and practically took over one of the two major parties that could have taken it over if it hadn't been for shenanigans you know about. Uh, uh, that's, uh, And it was primarily driven by young people. All of these are very hopeful signs. It means there are plenty of things that can be done. There are opportunities that can be grasped. Uh, and uh, no time to run through them, but there are plenty of them. And it's really very much in our hands and among the younger of you in your hands to carry us forward in this long path, long arduous path towards trying to create a civilized society and a decent world. Well, I'd like to ask both of you, there's been a lot of discussion in, in recent weeks about uh, the role of uh, workers, or the, of the working class in this election, of uh, Trump's supposed appeal uh, to white workers. And Harry, you know that the civil rights movement, as it was, uh, as it was growing and developing, uh, needed and was uh, f uh, fueled as well by progressive unions like 1199 and the auto workers and others that gave it strength and organization and resources. I'm wondering how you're looking at this issue, because, uh, Noam, as you mentioned, all the young people. The problem is that the young people, uh, the so-called creative classes, are increasingly concentrating in the big cities. <laughs> they're in Seattle, and they're in Chicago, and they're in New York, and, and then the issue then is what happens in the rest of the country. You know, back in the 60s and 70s, we used to say, you got to go back out and organize, <laughs> uh, organize in the communities from which you came from. Uh, how do you see this whole analysis of the, quote, loss of the working class to sort of progressive politics uh, that you're, we're hearing in the commercial and the corporate press? Well, take a look again at the last few elections. In two, uh, many of the Trump voters among the white working class voted for Obama. They were uh, deluded by the slogans of the campaign. You, may recall that the 2008 campaign uh, was based on the slogan, hope and change. Well, many people voted rightly uh, for hope and change. Uh, the working class has suffered, not disastrously, but severely from the neoliberal policies of the past generation pretty much from 1979. So if you look, say, just take the 2007, the peak of what economists were calling the economic miracle right before the crash. 2007, American workers had real wages lower, considerably lower than in 1979 before these policies were instituted. Uh, they lost, uh, it, listen to uh, Alan Greenspan, who during the height of the euphoria over the economy was called St. Alan, you know, the greatest economist of all time. Uh, he testified to Congress explaining the basis for the success of the economy that he was running. He said it was based on growing worker insecurity growing worker insecurity, meaning if workers are beaten down enough and intimidated enough, and if their uh, organizations, their unions are sufficiently destroyed that they can't ask for higher wages and for decent benefits, then it's good for the economy. It creates a healthy economy by some measure. We know the measure. Well, all of this has happened. Uh, and the working class has suffered from it. They had a real need for hope and change. Well, they didn't get hope and they didn't get change. I don't usually agree with Sarah Palin, but I think she, she nailed it when she asked at one point, uh, where's all this hopey changey business? Well, you know, there wasn't any. So no hope, no change. Uh, already, it showed very quickly in midterm and future elections. This election, a con man came along and is offering hope and change, and they're voting for it. 
Suppose that people like you, the people who formed the Sanders movement, would present an authentic, constructive uh, uh, program for real hope and change. It would win these people back. I think many of the Trump voters Uh, uh, many of the Trump, Trump voters could have voted for Sanders if there had been the right, uh, the right kind of activism and organization. And those are possibilities. It's been done in the past under much harsher circumstances. Uh, organizing uh, white working people in Indiana is a lot easier than uh, what the Freedom Riders tried to do in the South 60 years ago. Much easier. Uh, it takes work, but it can be done. And my feeling is that a core part of a progressive program is to rebuild the organized structure of the labor movement which all throughout modern history has been in the forefront of progressive change. And that's not impossible either. It's been beaten down pretty severely in the past generation, but it's been worse before. If you go back to the 1920s, a period which is not unlike today in many ways, the, the Gilded Age, you know, the, uh, the labor movement was virtually destroyed. Uh, Wilson, Woodrow Wilson's Red Scare practically wiped it out. There had been a militant activist labor movement. There was almost nothing left of it in the 1920s. By the 1930s, it revived. Uh, militant labor action, organization of the CIO, overcame racist conflicts, uh, laid the basis for the New Deal uh, programs, which were highly beneficial to the extent that they remain, they remain beneficial. That can happen again. No reason why it can't. Well. In a moment, um, Patty Smith is gonna be coming out on the stage to um, share her talents. But I wanted to wrap up with Harry. Um, you know, Democracy Now! originally came out of Pacifica Radio, which was five stations, WBAI in New York among them, and KPFT in Houston. And KPFT is the only radio station in the country whose transmitter was blown up. It was a few weeks after it went on the air in 1970, blown up by the Ku Klux Klan. And when they got back on their feet and rebuilt, the Klan blew it up again. Um, strapped 15 times the dynamite to the base of the transmitter. And it took months to get back on the air after that. And um, I can't remember if it was the Grand Dragon or the Exalted Cyclops, because I often confuse their titles. <laughs> but he said it was his proudest act, because he understood how dangerous Pacifica, how dangerous independent media is for people to speak for themselves. That's a story of history, though. Who would have thought in 2016 we'd be talking about the Ku Klux Klan today um, when President, when Donald Trump was asked whether he would disavow David Duke's support? You know, he hesitated. He said he'd have to find out more from David Duke or the Klan, which, um, you, you know, exactly who it was who was supporting him. Um, maybe the only time he hesitated before he spoke. You know, what was it? Which Klan chapter he wanted to know uh, in the United States it was to make a decision. But what about this? What about Donald Trump, the Ku Klux Klan, um, and the messages that he is constantly uh, putting out to lure more voters and support. I believe that Trump and bringing a new energy to the realization of the, uh, the vastness of uh, the reach of the Ku Klux Klan is uh, not something that has been out of the, our basic purview of thought. Uh, the Ku Klux Klan, for some of us, 
is a constant, uh, has a constant existence. Uh, it isn't until it touches certain aspects of white America that white America all of a sudden wakes up to the fact that uh, there's something called the Klan and that it does its mischief. Uh, what causes me to have great thought is something that's most unique to my experience. And as I said earlier tonight, uh, at the doorstep of being 90 years of age, I had thought I'd seen it all and done it all, only to find out that at 89, I knew nothing. <laughs> but the most peculiar thing to me has been the absence of the black presence in the middle of this resistance, not just the skirmishes that we've seen in Ferguson and uh, Black Lives Matter. And I think those protests and those voices being raised are extremely important. <laughs> but we blew this thing a long time ago. When they started the purge against communism in this country and against the voice of those who saw hope in a, a design for socialist theory and for the sharing of wealth and for the equality of humankind. Uh, when we abandoned our, visual, our, vis uh, our vision and visuals on that topic, I think we sold out ourselves. Uh, a group of young black students in Harlem just a few days ago asked me what at this point in my life was I looking for? And I said, uh, what I've always been looking for, where resides the rebel heart? Without the rebellious heart, it's about people who understand that uh, there's no sacrifice we can make that is too great to retrieve that which we've lost. We will forever be distracted with possessions and trinkets and title. And I think one of the big things that happened was that when black people began to be anointed by the trinkets of this capitalist society and uh, began to become big time players and began to become heads of corporations. They became players in the game of our own demise. Um, and although I believe that uh, Professor Chomsky's, uh, Chomsky's uh, evaluation is uh, valid and a basis for great thought. I am looking at the victories that we're having, like the ones we've just received a few days ago, with our Native American brothers. The fact that uh, our Native American brothers and sisters uh, stopped uh, the engine for a moment. is really a call for us to be reminded that the engine can be stopped. And therein I find uh, solace. Therein I find the capacity to really do things and create things uh, that will make a difference to where it appears we appear to be headed. Uh, I think people have to be more adventurous. The heart has to find greater space for rebellion. Uh, so,
We pay a penalty for such thought. But I was just recently reminded of Schwerner, Goodman, and Cheney. They sit particularly close to my own feelings and thoughts because I was one of the voices that was raised in recruiting those young students to participate in our rebellion. David Goodman, Andrew's brother, is here today. I'm sure that he's always at the right places. But uh, I think that there are those kinds of extremes that will be experienced in the struggle, but the real nobility of our existence is are we prepared to pay that price? And I think once the opposition understands that uh, we are quite prepared to die for what we believe in, <laughs> that death for a cause does not just sit with ISIS, but sits with people, uh, workers, people who are generally prepared to push against uh, the theft of our nation and the distortion of our constitution, and that for many of us, no price is too great for that charge. And we have great history to call upon. I mentioned a few before, but we still got a few left. And uh, I want to just take this opportunity, because I know we're winding down, to just say to you, Amy, and, and to you, John, that uh, I've been through much in this country. I came back from the Second World War. And while the world rejoiced in the fact that Hitler had been met and defeated, uh, there were some of us who were touched by the fact that instead of sitting at the table of feast at that great victory, we were worried about our lives because the response from many in America was the murder of many black servicemen that came back. And we were considered to be dangerous because we had learned uh, the capacity to handle weaponry. We had faced death in the battlefield. And when we came back, we had an expectation as the victors. We came back knowing that, yes, uh, we might have fought to end Hitler, but we also fought for our right to vote in America. And that in the pursuit of such rights uh, came the civil rights movement. Well, that can happen again. We just have to get out our old coats, dust them off, stop screwing around, and just chasing the good times, and get down to business. There's some ass kicking out here to be done, and we should do it. Thank you. Thank you very much.